Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. How are you doing today? It's good. Well, my name is Asher Hoday. I'm a junior at Bakersfield Adventist Academy, and I'm so glad we could join you all. And I will be giving you guys the sermon today. So let's pray and ask God to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Sabbath that you've given us and that we could come here and learn more about you. Just be with us and give us your spirit and allow your word to change us and be with us again. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there once was an old man who lived in a village, and he was known to be quite uh, a cranky, irritable, kind of snapped at people. He was just known that way. He's always been that way. The people just kind of ignored him. And then one day, all of a sudden, they noticed a change. He was talking. He was nice. He was receiving questions from the people, answering them. He was not snapping at people anymore. He was just a happy person. But the villagers decided, okay, what's going on? Something's up. We need to figure out what's up. So they pull the old man aside. They hold this meeting, and they ask him, what's going on? He used to be such a cranky, irritable guy, and now you're all happy you're joyful. It seems like everything's going well for you. And the old man replied, Well, all my life, I tried to pursue happiness. I tried and tried and tried to chase it, but I could never find it. Until finally, one day, I decided that I was not going to chase happiness anymore. I was just going to give up and let things be. But what the man found out is, as He did what he said. He noticed that every day, as he took every day, day by day, he noticed things started to look happy. He noticed good in things. He noticed things that brought him joy. And after a little bit, this changed him. So the pursuit of happiness is something that this world seems to have on their minds a lot, right? Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone's like, I want to find whatever can make me happy, I need to find that, and I need that to work, because happiness is something we all want to achieve. It even goes to the point that there's data, and there's polls that go around, and countries are ranked in order of the happiest people who live in them. So, for example, just in March, uh, Finland was ranked as the happiest country in the world, And yet, U.S. didn't even make the list. So again, the pursuit of happiness is just something that this world, we all try to pursue. It seems to be everyone's goal. In all this busyness and all this commotion we find ourselves in, we still try to be happy. Yet, happiness kind of seems exclusive. The more we pursue it, the more we try to become happy, a lot of times we find ourselves more unhappy than we were before. There's another story of a woman who called pest control. It was a frantic call, and she said, help, there's a skunk in my basement. And then the pest control said, all right, so here's a good idea. Lay a trail of breadcrumbs from your basement into the woods, and you'll be fine. Well, after a couple minutes, the lady called back again, and she said, help, there's two skunks in my basement now. (laughs) So it seems like the more and more we try to find happiness, a lot of times we end up taking one step forward and two steps back, right? So how, the question is, how do we find True happiness. Well, believe it or not, Solomon in the Bible, not only the wisest man in the world, but also he was gifted, he was rich, he had everything, he was a smart king, and 
you might think, well, he himself, he probably was so happy. He had all this vast amounts of wealth. He had all this knowledge. He had all these resources at his disposal. He could have been a very happy man. But in his book, Ecclesiastes, he actually writes about his own pursuit of happiness. And there's a lot to learn from this because Solomon learned something pretty much a very hard way. So if you guys have your Bibles, this is going to be interesting here, but if you guys have your Bibles, you can go to Ecclesiastes. And Solomon basically in this book, he just expounds and expounds on his own pursuit of happiness, and he has a lot to say on it. So if you guys have your Bibles, you can go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. In there. Okay, I found it. Okay. Ecclesiastes, and let's go to the book, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And here we find the first way that Solomon himself tried to find happiness in. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And let's read verse 1. It says, I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely, this also was vanity. Skipping down to verse 3. I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. And then finally, verse 8. I also gathered for myself silver and gold And the special treasures of the kings and of the provinces, I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So we see here that Solomon, he, of course, being the king, being the the person he is with all the resources he has, he has male, female singers. It says in the first verse we read, he indulged himself in pleasure, Uh, He had silver and gold, a vast amount of stuff. And he says in verse 8, and the delights of the sons of men. So Solomon, he tried to find happiness in what we would call entertainment. Entertainment. Now, entertainment for him wasn't going to the movies or playing video games or listening to music or anything like that. Entertainment back then was, you know, he had his male, female singers, Uh, probably they had some old type of theater back then. And even in verse 3, we saw that he enjoyed drink. He enjoyed pleasure. You know, this guy, he tried to find happiness in entertainment. Do you think that worked for him? No. And he still writes about the results of how he chose that path. So in Ecclesiastes still, we're going to be spending a lot of time in this book. But Ecclesiastes... We're going to go to chapter 7, and he writes about the results of his pursuit of happiness through entertainment. Now, this is an interesting analogy, but let's unpack this. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 6. For like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Now, if you think about this analogy he kind of uses here the crackling of thorns in a pot. He's describing a, a kind of a, a showy thing where there's a pot burning, there's thorns in there, those thorns are burning, it's creating a show, it's creating a noise, it's bright. I mean, yeah, it would be such a, a, a bright sight to see just thorns crackling, sparkling into a pot, right? But, he continues on, he compares it, so is the laughter of the fool. So what he's describing here is a fool, basically, who's enjoying entertainment, who's laughing with the entertainment. It's like a loud, bright burning of thorns inside a pot. It might seem cool. It might seem bright, flashy at the moment. But how long will it take for those thorns to burn off? See, Solomon here is describing that in his pursuit of happiness, first he tries out entertainment, he indulges himself in all these pleasures, 
But it was so short-lived, it seemed so nice, so great, so grand at the moment, but it died off very quickly. So for us, you know, in our world today, entertainment is a big thing. We see movies, listen to music, play video games, and those things might be all right in a good context, but if we're trying to find happiness in those things, can you guess what will happen? It's short-lived, it seems all great at the moment, but after a little bit, it'll die off, and all we're left with is ashes. And you can kind of compare these, you know, uh, Fourth of July is a big event in the U.S. And when you, what you have is a lot of times you have fireworks displays, uh, large parades. But what takes maybe weeks and weeks to prepare for all culminates to one day. And even the fireworks themselves, right, they're great explosions of light in the sky, so grand. But if you compare those Again, to the stars God has put in the sky, the stars may seem dim when you look at them from our earth, but if you get closer to them, you'll see that they're bright. They pretty much last for a long, long time. It's just the point that Solomon here is making is that trying to pursue happiness through entertainment is going to avail to nothing. So Solomon... He tried to find happiness through entertainment. He realized, no, this was not the way. Let's look at what else he, he tried to find happiness through. Let's go to Ecclesiastes, skipping back to chapter 1. So Solomon realizes entertainment's not going to cut it. It's so short-lived. It's, it seems great at the moment, but it dies out fast. What do I do now? So Solomon looks, and he, reads, he writes about it, chapter 1. Let's go to verse 16. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 16. It says, I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness, and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. Verse 17, And I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. So what did Solomon try to find happiness in? Wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge, right? He studied science, art, biology, psychology, anything you could think of, math. He's just trying to fill his mind with all of these areas of knowledge, with vast amounts of knowledge, and he tried, and he thought... If only I could understand everything in this world, I can be fulfilled and I can be happy. Do you think that worked for him? No. He later writes about it in Ecclesiastes 2. He says in verse 14, The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceived that the same event happens to them all. And then, verse 16, For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that, it, that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As the fool. It's kind of ironic how this works out, because Solomon, being the wisest man in the world, having that wisdom given to him from God, he kind of explores. He kind of says, you know, maybe if I dabbled in the knowledge of men, kind of just tried to, to uh, indulge myself in all this wisdom and knowledge of the world, maybe I can get a little, little bit smarter. But he soon realized, and this is the analogy he uses, that the wise man meets the same death as the fool. And this is not saying, oh, it's bad to get smarter. Oh, it's bad to go to school. You know, <laughs> I go to school myself. But <laughs> it's not saying that. It's bad to do all these things. You know, in this world, we definitely need to be smart people. But in this context, it's saying if we're trying to find happiness 
and just pouring ourselves with knowledge, of just getting degree after degree, diploma after diploma, if we're trying to pour ourselves into that, trying to gain happiness, Amen. all we're doing is meeting the same death as a fool. And even in the, in the first verse, he compares it to grasping for the wind, right? The wind is unpredictable. It goes where it wants to go. We can never tell where it's going. It's like grasping for that, trying to gain all this knowledge, all this wisdom through the earth. It's like chasing the wind because you'll never catch it. One guy put it, there's wisdom and truth, but not always happiness and knowledge. No, as much as people try to search for happiness inside knowledge, they won't find it. They're going to be more and more unhappy than before. They're still be, going to be left with a void that still needs to be fulfilled and be left wondering. So knowledge won't bring us happiness. Solomon continues. He explores another area. And this is a quite an interesting one. In Ecclesiastes 2 again, we go back to verse 4. And verses 4 through 6, he says, I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. This here, he's describing another area of where he tried to be happy. So he's like, if I can't be happy in entertainment, if I can't be happy in, in all this earthly knowledge, then maybe, just maybe, I can find happiness in work. And that's, that's not to say, of course, God has given us work. He actually gave it to us in the Garden of Eden for us to, to enjoy. But again, if your focus is to find happiness in work, you often find yourselves overworking. And Solomon even says this in verses 18 through 19 of chapter 2. <laughs> he says quite an interesting thing. First phrase, Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise or a fool, Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled and which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. So again, looking at what he says here, he expounds, he says, well, yes, this work might bring me enjoyment, but I just look at the long list of, of things he did there. Like he's building, he's creating, he's, he's working out in the fields, he's He's building pools for himself. It says even specifically he made his works great, building houses, planting vineyards. He's doing so many things, and it came to the point where he says, I hate my labor. So again, for us, in this world, how many of us try to say, oh, if I get this career, if I build up my respect and honor in this career, if I, if I work myself towards this, then I can be truly, truly happy. But again, Solomon makes another point. He says, he figured that if, if he could keep himself busy, he might be happy. And catch what he says, he comes to the realization that all of his labors, all of his fruits might not be seen until later on, and he speculates who knows? Who knows what my descendants are going to do with the work I have done? And it came to the point, because he had overworked himself so much, because he had spent so much time in trying to find fulfillment, trying to find happiness in his work, he hated it. He speculated, well, what's it going to amass to? My descendants just wasting my fruits and my labors away. So again, if we try to find happiness through work, we might end up overworking ourselves, burdening ourselves, coming to the point where we're like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, work is supposed to be a thing that we should enjoy in moderation, 
but not as something where we can think, I can find happiness in it. We already looked over this, but another area where Solomon tried to find happiness in, it describes in verses 7 and 8, I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. So he mentions the servants, he mentions the herds, the flocks, silver and gold. He's like, all right, I've done so much already. How about I just enjoy all this wealth? How about if this money, this vast amounts of wealth, this silver and gold, if I just enjoy it, I can become truly happy. Well, was he right? Would money bring lasting happiness? Well, money, of course, we all love that green piece of paper. Or now we're kind of heading to cards and checks. But money might bring a certain level of satisfaction, but... Again, it's not going to fulfill that void that we want to be filled. Money is not going to bring us happiness. In fact, Solomon explains later on, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. Solomon realizes that we'll never be content. If we try to find happiness through money, through wealth, we won't be content because the more and more we seek it, the more and more we'll want more of it. We won't be content with what we have. And in fact, there's a lot of, lot of examples in history of famous people, who've gathered vast amounts of money, built up their wealth, but they died a sad death. They lost all their money gambling or were depressed, sad, lonely. Many cases of that where money it can be used for a good thing, but money has destroyed people's lives. So money... Even though it's a major factor in the pursuit of happiness today, money is not going to provide that happiness that we really, really want. And Jesus even hints at, hints at this in the prodigal son. Uh, I won't go there right now. But in Luke 15, about the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son, he wanted to go away. He wanted to receive his father's inheritance, his father's money. He thought that by going away to a far country, he could find happiness through all this money he had. But what did it end up? He ended up poor. He ended up working with pigs. He spent and spent, and finally, all of his money was gone. And yet, what people don't realize is, well, yes, of course, money can be a factor for good, and yes, money can be a factor for simple enjoyment, but is money really going to give you fulfillment? Is it really going to give you a happiness that you really want? So Solomon's summary here is that nothing human brings total happiness. In fact, what he says is in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 11, Ecclesiastes 2.11, it says, Then I looked on all the works my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed it was all vanity and grasping for the wind, for there is no profit under the sun. So he realizes that happiness can't be found through entertainment, through work, through riches, through knowledge, Nothing human can bring total happiness. 
friends, all these things that Solomon described, he went through it. I mean, this guy, he had all of these riches, he had all this wisdom, he had all of these things here he's describing, but he himself realizes, no, I can't find happiness in these, I need to look somewhere else. Our scripture reading was in Matthew. Oh, it wasn't. <laughs> it was actually in John. But in the scripture reading, it talks about joy that God can give us. If you remember, it was talking about love and us keeping God's commandments. And at the end, my joy I give you that your joy may be full. In all of Solomon's discoveries, he uses a word that summarizes the search through these things, and he says, it is all vanity. And now vanity is a very interesting word, and he uses that word a lot in what he's describing here. But one of the definitions says, the quality of being worthless or being futile. So he's saying, all these things that I tried to do, all of these things I tried to, to get to be happy, it all turned out to be worthless. It all turned out to be futile in the end because those things did not fulfill me. So how do we find true happiness? If these things can't bring us lasting joy, lasting happiness, what, what must we do to receive that? Well, Solomon gives the answer in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 26. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and what? And joy to a man who is good in his sight, but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. And this is also vanity and grasping for the wind. So God gives joy God is the one who gives real happiness. Well, I could stop the sermon right there and say, all right, perfect. God gives joy. But there's more to it. There's many, many things, and I could spend a lot on this, but there's many, many things in the Bible that are described how we can find happiness and joy through God. And I'll just, I'll just give a few right now. Paul is an amazing example of himself finding happiness. And it's interesting because in the book Philippians, he writes while he was in prison. And as he was being persecuted, he was being persecuted. Yet in all of this book, there is one word that stands out more than any other word. And that is the word joy. In this relatively brief letter, Paul mentions the word joy 16 times. And he also mentions the word Christ 50 times. And that's for the simple reason Paul found happiness even in prison, even in persecution, in Christ. Well, how did he do it? In Philippians 1, you guys can go there if you want. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1 and verse 7 he says this, Philippians 1, verse 7. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Now, the last phrase, with the word grace in it, Paul mentions that word grace in a lot of his writings. And in Ephesians, we know that it says grace, we are saved by grace, through grace, through faith, not of ourselves, but the gift of God. But that word grace, he realizes that grace is part of happiness. When we realize that God's grace saves us, when we realize that God's grace transforms us, we find happiness. And Paul even goes to the point in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he states very plainly, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. 
because he realizes that God's grace gave him happiness, even when he was in prison, even when he was being persecuted, he still found, found happiness. He realized that the awesomeness of God's grace, that God's grace saves, God's grace changes, God's grace forgives, he rejoices, and God's grace gave him happiness. And you know the best thing about God's grace? It's free. God's grace is free. All we have to do is accept it. But God's grace isn't the only thing that can bring us happiness. This is where the scripture reading was from. John chapter 15. I'll just read that again. John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Now this section is talking about love. Love. God's love. Now this is really, really powerful. But in the same chapter, at the beginning, it talks about Jesus being the true vine. And he says in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So this whole overarching chapter, and especially in the last section there about joy and love, the simple truth is, is that God's love brings us happiness. Now, how does it do that? Well, it says plainly, if you abide in my love, if you realize my love for you, if you take that love and love me back, you will receive joy. You will receive not only superficial enjoyment, you won't even receive that, but he says, my joy, that your joy may be full. Isn't that amazing? So do you abide in God's love? Do you connect to the vine? And do you allow God's love to give you joy? Next thing that the Bible tells us that can give us happiness is shown in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 28 says, But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And quite a simple statement there, but blessed is also another word for, for being happy. Happy is the one who receives God's word and keeps it. So again, this verse is saying that happy are those who read God's word, who absorb God's word, who spend time in his word every day, allow his word to change you, you will find happiness in God's word. And the, and the amazing thing is, God's word isn't just a bunch of letters scribbled down. Hebrews chapter 4 describes God's word of being alive, being active. It, it goes far as saying, using a, a literal, not really literal, but an analogy to a literal thing, cutting down to the heart, to bone, and to marrow. So God's word is not just supposed to be a, a storybook to glance at. God's word is supposed to be enjoyed. It's supposed to be absorbed. It's supposed to be allowed to change us because God says happy are those who read God's word 
and keep it. So the more you read, the more you dig deep into God's word, the more you let God's truth change you, that too will give you happiness. The final thing is trust. Now trust in our world today is kind of a interesting subject, you know, for a relationship to be successful, there needs to be trust two-way, right? But as it is with our earthly relationships, also is with our heavenly relationship. Psalms chapter, Psalms 84, specifically declares in verse 12, O Lord of hosts, there's a word again, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Happy is the man who trusts in you. Now this is, this is an amazing thing that kind of connects everything together. God's word, God's love, God's grace. In order for us to be able to, to fully grasp the deepest meanings and the deepest connections we can have with these things, we must have trust in God. Now, this crazy world, this busy world, you know, just looking at the news, you can see everything that's happening around. But God says we can find happiness in trusting in Him. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall do what? Direct your paths. Another cool connection to this is actually shown in Matthew chapter 6. It's also shown in Luke. But when Jesus gives the example of how to pray, there are a lot of trust elements in his prayer. So looking, we can start, uh, let's see, yeah. We can start in verse 9, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, and it says, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, this, this prayer is so powerful because this is the model prayer that God gives for us. Not that we pray these exact words every day, but take elements from this prayer and apply it to our daily prayers. But one thing that stands out in this prayer is trust. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, Lord, not mine. I trust you to give me this day my daily bread. I trust you to forgive me my sins and my debts. I trust you to keep me from temptation. I trust you to deliver us from the evil one. And I trust that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Isn't that amazing? So trusting God, and this is where it comes down to, trusting God to lead our lives to keep us safe, to, to give us everything we need. In fact, the other verse I was going to go to earlier was about not laying down treasures here on this earth, but laying up treasures in heaven. When we trust that God has a better place waiting for us in heaven, then we can be happy. And that trust would not only allow us to receive his fulfilling joy, will not only allow us to be happy, but his trust will lead us into a closer relationship with him because as we grow closer and closer to Jesus, we become happier. We realize, yes, God, you can make me happy. You alone can give me joy. And we will enjoy every moment spending time with Jesus. So what Jesus is saying 
and especially through the words of Solomon here, is that don't be looking for happiness in this world because it will all lead to vanity. Jesus is saying, find true happiness in me. Just like the example of Solomon, you know, it's kind of a sad story, but Solomon himself, he, uh, he, he made mistakes. He had about 700 wives, 300 concubines, just all these things. Even though he trusted God to give him wisdom, he still made his own mistakes. But for us, we can't realize our mistakes until it's too late. So happiness can't be found in entertainment. It can't be found in work. It can't be found in knowledge or even money. But true happiness can only be found in, number one, God's grace. Because we know God's grace saves us. God's grace changes us. But also, abiding in God's love will give us happiness. Reading his word, drawing closer to him, trusting in Jesus as our Savior and friend, those things will give us true happiness. So Jesus is calling you. Just like the prodigal son that we saw earlier who thought he could find happiness through money, yet he realized there was only one place where he could be happy. And that was his father's house. And our father is calling us not to chase the wind, not trying to grasp the wind and live our lives running a silly goose chase. But God is saying, come to me. I will give you rest. I will give you joy. Not artificial pleasure, not artificial enjoyment, but lasting, everlasting, eternal happiness in me. How many of you want to say, God, maybe I'm pursuing a futile path. Maybe I'm pursuing a worthless path. But how many of you want to say, God, I know that I can do everything I can possibly try to fulfill this void, but only you, God, only you can fulfill it. How many of you want to say to God, I want to allow your grace to change me. I want to abide in your love. I want to find happiness in your word, and I want to have joy in trusting in you. Well, there are keys, many keys that people think can open the door of happiness, but God has the master key. He has the only key that can unlock pure fulfilling happiness in him. How many of you want that key? Me too. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us today that only you can fulfill the void that we may find in our hearts. Only you can give us true, lasting happiness. Father, we pray that you will give us that happiness. Show us the way. Show us that you are the way the truth and the life, and that you can give us joy because we know we are in your presence. Just be with us this Sabbath and guide us the rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen.